Okay, good evening. This is the beginning of uh, a very exciting series. Uh, we'll be doing this for several months. We're going to learn something that is complex and something that people rarely get an opportunity to study in depth, which is uh, getting to know yourself. And the reason it's so important is because uh, there has never been, as you probably sense, there has never been another person ever like you in history, not with your intellectual profile, not with your psychological profile, not with your emotional profile, not with your physical profile, not with your spiritual profile. And there will never be anyone like you again in history. There's no one on the planet like you right now. You're a complete one-time event in history. And if you are in fact a one-time event in history, that means you must be sent here on a very special mission. But you can't know your mission unless you know who you are. So we're going to be studying the science of getting to know who you are. Sometimes I offer this, this muscle, this metaphor. Imagine that there is a terrible accident and the paramedics arrive and they, they, uh, they find the, the, this, this car in flames. They go in and they, they pull two people out and miraculously they're still alive, but not in great shape. And these, these two people are rushed off by a helicopter to a, to a hospital. And they do the best they can to keep them alive, but uh, they both end up in a coma. Six months later, the doctor's checking one of their charts. Nebuch, this poor fellow, has been in a coma for six months. And suddenly, the man opens his eyes. And the doctor looks at him, and the man looks at the doctor. And the doctor says, I can't believe it. You're alive. And, and the man says, where am I? And at that moment, the other fellow who was in the car with him opens his eyes. And the doctor says, it's a miracle. And the two men say, where are we? And he says, there was a terrible accident, and you were found, and, and, and we were able to save your life, but you were in a coma for the last six months. I can't believe you're alive. And then one of the men looks at the other man, and he turns towards the doctor, and he says, who am I? And the other man, in pain, says, who am I? And the doctor says, listen, bad news. In the accident, all your identification was burned. We, we don't have any written record of who you are. But what we do know is this. Next to you in the car was this box of plumber's tools. And next to you in the car was this box of electrician's tools. Okay. Now we know. He's a plumber, and he's an electrician. If you can identify the tools that you've got. If you like, can I take a look inside and see who God made you, you can start to have a sense of why you're here on planet Earth. So rather than just slipping and sliding through 120 years here, our recommendation is, oh, careful right there, <laughs> our recommendation is that you actually get to know who you are and then pursue your purpose with vigor and clarity. So with that in mind, we are going to launch into an investigation for the next few months, trying to get clarity on who are you, which is obviously very different than the person sitting next to you. OK, now, I mentioned at the outset that this is a very sophisticated science. And anyone who's studied any sophisticated science ever knows that you don't just jump in head over heels in the middle of a science. There always has to be an introduction. You first need to get some basics down in place. And once those basics are in place, then you can delve into more sophisticated ideas. So tonight is purely 100% introduction. And I'm going to start with information that is not really relevant to the actual investigation, but something that you've got to know to orient yourself properly so that when you walk into this classroom to begin this investigation, you have the right perspective. The source that we're looking over tonight is, if you don't have a copy, please look on with somebody else. 
is an essay from Rav Shlomo Volba of Blessed Memory writing in his magnum opus, The Alei Shur. The essay is called Hevdel Hadoros, The Difference Between the Generations. And you'll see that this essay will properly orient us for the project that we are about to begin. Revolba writes as follows. Lo haray ador ha'achron kaharay ador ha'kodmin belimud musr. This most recent generation is nothing like previous generations when it comes to the study of Musar. When it comes to the study of improving yourself, changing yourself. Ad l'chor ben yadut Europa, before the destruction of European Jewry, hayu anashim yotir tekifim, People were much stronger, Badas, with their mind. They were, much, they were much more powerful in their use of their mind, as opposed to being more emotional and less able to process reality in a cognitive fashion. In, in what Revolve is implying here is that we've lost the ability to deal with reality in a calm, logical fashion. And therefore, whatever appeals to us emotionally is what establishes reality for us. And although emotions play a very significant role in serving God properly, in doing everything that we have to do on this planet, emotions serve a very important role. Emotions are like a limb. And just as I serve with my hands and my, my feet, so too I have to serve with my emotions. But just as my hands and feet are not good devices for detecting reality, so too emotions are not the best device for detecting reality. For that, we've been given an intellect. Once we've decided what the reality is, then we put all of our limbs to use, including the emotions, in taking care of that reality. So Revolba says, in the old days, people were much stronger in their das. They were, they were much more able to use their minds. And they could much more independently deal with life's problems. What do we mean that pre-World War II people could much more independently deal with life pro life's problems? Consider the following. Many of you spent time with your grandmothers. Many of you may have even met your great-grandmothers. So do you remember what your great-grandmother felt about her psychologist. Do you remember? <laughs> now, why are you laughing? So obviously, the reason is because your great-grandmother didn't have a psychologist. So how did she function? How did she get up in the morning? How did she deal? Now, we're not making fun of psychologists. In fact, it's very important for a person to have whatever they need to get through the day. And in this generation, Rebobo would be the first to admit that a psychologist could be very, very helpful. But in those days, psychologists were not part of the picture. People dealt with life. People survived death marches. So what we're saying is that in previous generations, people could handle life. Question. Um, isn't psychology a science that was just discovered later on? Like people many years ago had no physician. No medicine wasn't discovered. So people didn't rely as much on physicians. Certainly, you're asking a very good question. Isn't psychology something that's new? And certainly, there are new schools of psychology. Yeah, but Freud is not new. And, uh, and, and, and the reality is that if there was a burning need for people to talk to others, then the market forces would have created counselors that people would have gone to to talk things through. There were people who went to the Rav, the Rebbe, uh, and it could be even that they poured out their heart at times to speak to the Rebbe. But the, the reality was that the Rebbe wasn't serving the purpose of today's modern psychologist. Today, many of my students, they, they, they're in crisis over the fact that their parents don't give them enough money. Uh, it, it, there, you know, if if uh, if a, a, a person moves from one country to another, that could put them into 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 shock. They may not be able to handle life at that point, right? And then you think of what your grandmothers were like. It's different. Revolba says, 
There are many changes from the previous generation. The economic and social status The economic and social status of the people who learned Torah in those days was at the lowest conceivable level, meaning when Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky came to Eretz Yisrael for the first time, he, uh, he arrived in the country. He went straight to a base midrash because he wanted to learn Torah. He went straight to a house of study. He wanted to learn Torah. He walked into the house of study, and there was another fellow sitting there learning. So Rav Yaakov sat down his first time in Eretz Yisrael, and he started to learn. After a while, he had learned, and it was time for him to get settled. And so he walked over to the other fellow, and he said to him, Shalom Aleichem, Yaakov Kamenetsky, uh, man introduced himself, and then uh, and Rav Yaakov said, I'm sorry, I, I told, told the story wrong. Rav Yaakov was actually going to sit and learn, learn a little bit longer. The other fellow had to leave. The other fellow introduced to himself to Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, and he said, uh, Shalom Aleichem, my name is so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I'm going to be going now. So the fellow said, uh, uh, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky said, very nice. It was very nice to meet you. I'm just going to stay a little longer because I just got there at Yisrael. I'd like to learn a little longer. And the man said, no, no, I have to leave now. So Rav, the, Rav Yaakov said, uh, fine, I understand. Uh, I, uh, I'll just be here uh, uh, a little longer. So the man said, no, no, you don't understand. The light bulb belongs to me. OK, now. Um, we have a number of light bulbs in this room, and I'm not planning on taking any of them home. Uh, the kind of yeshiva building that we're sitting in at this moment dwarfs just in the strength of the walls the mirror in Poland. <laughs> you know, we're, the, the, we're, 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 we're living a life today that is so far beyond anything that we can possibly imagine in Jewish history. Uh, so economically, the B'nai Torah at a much higher level. Also, socially, in those days, a person who was learning Torah full time had a very difficult time getting a shidduch. He couldn't get engaged. Because who would want to be married to somebody who was going to be starving to death? Right? Now, in today, things have changed a bit. <laughs> right? And if you have a very fine student who's learning at a very fine yeshiva, so the only question is, will his father-in-law be paying him $10,000 a year or $50,000 a year? But the B'nai Torah today, the, they're, they're, they're pretty comfortable in most places. Yeah, the, 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 the people who are learning in New York or learning in Rehavi or, or other places in, 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 in the world today, many of them are comfortable. Not everybody. Some people are still really sacrificing. But many are comfortable. That's not the way it used to be. By the way, comfortable to, again, to a degree that couldn't have been ma imagined in, in Jewish history. So socially and economically, they were on a much lower level in those days. Aval, mibichinat rucham, but spiritually, hayudorit etanim. They were very powerful people spiritually. Now that leads to an obvious question, which is if they were so powerful spiritually, then why is it that when the Enlightenment came, a bunch of them took their tefillin and threw it in a trash can? How did that happen if they were so powerful spiritually? And we know how much damage was done by the Enlightenment. So Revolb explains, Ella, the winds that were blowing in those days, it put these people in front of, of tests that you and I can't imagine. We can't imagine because we're not the same sort of people. But when the Enlightenment hit, and for the first time, a Jew could head off to university. And in university, you could sit down and learn Kant. And, and Kant was such a mind-boggling philosophy. And it didn't necessarily shtim. It wasn't necessarily consistent with everything that was said in the Talmud or the Medrash. So the people in those days were torn to pieces by that. Now, it's been a long time since I met a Jew who went off the derech because he read Kant. Today, that's not the thing that's dragging students down, right, down the drain. That's not it. Because today, people are much less driven by their minds. Right? There's other things that pull people off. So we can't really imagine what was the test. You know, they were able for the first time to learn philosophy. What was the test? Philosophy wouldn't do anything to us today. If you opened up Aristotle, it's not going to shake the foundations of your faith. So what was going on, we can't relate. But what we know is 
that it was a tornado, a spiritual tornado, again, that we can't imagine. Kasher Marana, going Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel, Meslabadkin, Nerei Den, Hit Konin, Liasad Yeshiva To. When Rabbi Nassim Tzvi Finkel decided to set up his yeshiva in Slabodka, who Sha'alit Rabbi Yisrael, he went to his Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, and he asked him, Al Ezi Yisod Tzarek Lamid at the yeshiva. What will be the foundation of our yeshiva? By the way, this is fascinating. In those days, people didn't open a yeshiva because they needed a job. He opened a yeshiva because there was a crisis going on. And the yeshiva was a tool which was going to come and resolve that crisis. So he, he asked his Rebbe, what is the crisis that you want me to resolve? Vuhuanalo and Rav Yisrael told him, this is why you must open Slobodka. And he quoted a verse, Lachayot ruch shvalim. You must revive the spirit of the downtrodden. Lachiot levni kaim. Bring to life the hearts of those who have been crushed. These people were giants and they didn't realize it. And Rav Yisrael assigned his student, Rav Nassim Sui Finkel, bring them back to life. Perform spiritual CPR on these people. And that was the purpose of the yeshiva. Now, of course, what did they do all day? They learned Gemara. But they learned Gemara with a purpose. And the purpose was of this yeshiva, bring these people back to life spiritually. Help them recognize who they are, despite the fact that socially they have no status and they're starving. All of his life, Rav Nassim Sufinkel was committed, dedicated to this task. To lift up those people who were learning Torah, Baruchah, spiritually, ulag biyam, meshefo matzavam, and to, to raise them out of their, their low status, Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel set up for them uh, places where they could eat every day, so none of the boys would be hungry. Uh, when, a, when a boy showed up in Slobodka, you can imagine what kind of clothes he was wearing. He had hand-me-downs from someone who got hand-me-downs. And he showed up at Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel's door, and Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel took the boy by the arm, and said, young man, come with me. And he took him into town, and he bought him a suit, a brand new suit, and not just a suit. Rav Nassim bought them the hottest fashion of the time, right, a white Panama suit. <laughs> and they bought them white Panama hats. If you look at the pictures of Slobodka, these guys were dressed to kill. They were decked out. And of course, Rav Nussin Finkel's intention was that perhaps the costume would help them realize who they are. So he started to bring these boys back to life. Vachain Hamid Gedoli Olam. And he was successful. And he raised some of the greatest people ever in history. He taught them who they were. They plugged into that. They followed their identity, and as a result of following their identity, each one of them became great. Meaning the underlying assumption behind what Revolve was writing is that do God doesn't create somebody who's number two, who's ordinary. God only creates number ones. You are not ordinary. You are chelik eloka mimal, you're a little piece of God. And when he sent you here, he sent you here to shine. So just as Rav Nassim Tzvi Finkel found a way for the people of his generation to shine, our job in this generation is for us to find out who we are, plug into that, and to shine. Not to be ordinary. Hayom, today, Matzavam HaKakali V'chevreti Shel B'nei Yeshivos, the social and financial status of the people who learn Yeshiva, Hishtaper Le'ein Erech, it's improved beyond measure. Avaladoros Yardu Plaim B'hasogat Romus Ha'adam B'gadlus B'Torah. But the generation has dropped terribly since before World War II in their understanding of two concepts. One is Romus Ha'adam, the exaltedness of a human being. And the second is Godless B'Torah, greatness in Torah. What do I mean we've, we've lost touch with what it means the, the exaltedness of a human being? If, if you saw um, orange juice splash on to a safer Torah, you would gasp. It, you'd be, you, it would be horrific in your mind. 
But for me to walk out of my house with a stain on my clothing is not such a big deal. Even though the Torah says that if Talmud walk, Hochum walks out of his house with a removable stain on his clothing, he's Chayv Misa, he should be put to death. And we look at that passage in the Talmud and we think, why so extreme? I mean, he's just a guy. In other words, he's not just a guy. The human being is a walking, talking Sefer Torah. Now, the letters may or may not have come out yet, but that's who you are. You're a walking, talking, you are a piece of Kedusha, you're a piece of holiness. And, and, and the whole goal here is to get back, what is the concept of Goddess Adam? Why, why are you so great? What is so great about you? Who are you? He says, Dibrim al liot gadol b'Torah. Today, when people speak about, I want to be a gadol b'Torah. Hey, my yom amir ba'alma. He said, it's just talk. It's just talk. Meaning, people don't really know what those words mean. Hamadaber al zeod. Someone who still speaks about being a gadol b'Torah. Tziru b'mahuta godless more fell meod. His picture of what greatness looks like is very cloudy. Like if you say to someone, well, what is a gadol b'Torah? What exactly is that? Yitakin she'kavanahi, lemisra Torah nit mechubedet. It could be that what the person means by a gadol b'Torah is they'll have a really important job title. Like they'll be the Rosh Hashiva, or they'll be the Rav Harashi, the head of the, 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 the Rabbanut, or something like that. By the way, does anyone know, let's say, Rav Yashav, Zikron Rakh of blessed memory, his formal title, Rav Yashav's formal title, does anyone know? He wasn't called a Rosh Hashiva because he wasn't a Rosh Hashiva. His formal title was, again, yeah, I don't know it either. He didn't really have a formal title. They called him one of the greatest sages of the generation. But he never, I mean, he had a job for a while. He worked for the Rabbanut. Yeah, then eventually he retired. Uh, but what was his title? So it can't be that being a Gadol B'Torah, being a spectacularly giant human being, has to do with having some really famous title. Godless shall emes, true greatness, kimat ne'elema mitoch shetach It's pretty much hidden from most of our perspectives, most of our viewpoints. Why? Most of us have not spent intimate time hanging out with someone who has actually brought forth their greatness. So therefore, what, what I know about great people is that they appear on cards that we trade. Yeah? Or their signatures appear at the bottom of posters. Right? Or in, you know, at the bottom of public announcements. But I don't really know who that person is or what they're like. And, and even more, what's so amazing, thank you so much, what's so amazing is that when you do spend time with someone who's truly a giant, the, the popular reaction, and, and you'll see how common this is, the popular reaction when someone's, someone for the first time actually goes and like, they spend a Shabbos with someone who's a giant, they come back and they say, you know, they were so, they were so normal. So normal. Yeah. By the way, that's an achievement. <laughs> to be so normal, yeah? We don't know what, what greatness looks like, and therefore when we see someone who's normal, we're like, wow, that's amazing, that's what it looks like? When we speak today about the exaltedness of a human being, the, today's Torah students have a very hard time understanding what do those words mean, exaltedness of a human being? The few examples of, of, of true greatness, right? The Rov Lom De Torah. People don't recognize these people. They don't know them well. So therefore, we are challenged. And therefore, Volba says, The vast majority of people in this generation cannot take serious tochacha. Now, normally we translate tocha as rebuke, but Rashi translates it differently. Rashi says that the definition of tocha is 
Birur Dvarim, a clarification of reality. And that's going to be the approach that we're going to be taking for the next several months is that tochacha does not mean blasting somebody. In fact, there probably is no source in Jewish law for blasting somebody. We don't have such a concept. What we do have is a concept of tochacha is from the word mochiach, which means to prove, to demonstrate, to clarify. We have a concept of helping somebody else achieve an understanding of reality. And most people today can't take it. They can't deal with reality. Certainly, they can't take a, a brusque clarification, a strong clarification. Like previous generations heard, like they heard from their rabbis. Also, this technique, it's called Nituach Maisim, it's an extraordinary technique where you can actually get clarity in your own motivations, in what's driving you, in your own character traits. And the way that you do this, this process of Nituach Maisim, of basically surgery on your, on your own behavior to see like, what is really behind what I'm doing is you look for consistency or inconsistency in behavior. So for example, let's say that uh, let's say that I, I suspect that I'm a tremendous Baal Chesed, I'm a very kind person. And I can give evidence of that by showing that today I did kindness for 10 strangers that I had never met before I did kindness for them today. So that indicates that I'm kind. Then we perform Yituach Maisim, and what we discover is that every single one of those 10 people that I took care of today has a salary that's either six or seven digits. And there were 30 people who needed my help today who were not doing so financially well, and I didn't do chesed for them. Nituach Maisim helps me see, Leib, you think you're a big ball chesed. You think you're really a very kind person, but what you really are is someone who loves money. So that kind of process, Nituach Maisim, he says, you can't do it with most people today. If you perform that sort of clarification of reality for most people, they'll crumble. We're holding so close to the water, our self-esteem is so low that if you actually so, show somebody that they're not 100% perfect, they will come apart the seams. And of course, you can't keep the facade up forever, so what most people experience today is they swing in their self-esteem radically. They first fool themselves into thinking that they're perfect. And they hold on to that for as long as they can until there are so many obvious disappointments that they realize, gosh, I'm not only not perfect, I'm terribly flawed, I'm broken. And then their self-esteem goes down the tubes and they feel terrible about themselves. But a person can't live there. So then they create this fantasy, forgetting about all of those proofs that they actually are not so perfect, they create this fantasy to know that really I am great and perfect. And they lie to themselves and they lie to others as well. And they go back to this perspective that I'm a giant, I'm great, right? I have prophecy, I have tremendous insight, my intuition is faultless, right? And then when that fails, then they go back to, gosh, I, I'm so worthless. And they have these wild swings because they're not living in reality. And, and Revolva says most people can't handle the reality, which is, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very scary state. Nituach ma'isim, umidos, when we actually perform this procedure, right, ad until we actually unveil the flaws that are underneath, yotri mashu yachki, more than it makes most people wise, pridaka, it crushes people. Vigrom yeush l'bnei doreinu atsirim, and it creates despair among the young people in this generation. Only after an extended period of lifting people's spirits, of making them, them feel good about themselves, legitimately good, by pointing out things that are really, truly good about them. And rooting within them the reality that if you're a human being, you are created in God's image, that you are a holy creature, that you are, the, you are separated by the Rebona Shalom by a hair's breadth. There's a hair's breadth between you and God. And then every other creature in the universe, including the angels, are miles below you. So if you can root that in a person, you can stabilize them. Then, 
tzad hapchitu shel adam. Only then can a person start to look at the dark side of the human being, at the flaws. By the way, why would this even be a goal? So the answer is, um, I'll give you two, two metaphors. The first one is as follows. Imagine that uh, you're walking down the street and suddenly I show up next to you and I say, wait a minute. You look at me and I say, do you know that 10 feet ago you made the terrible error of walking past a treasure chest with $10 million in it buried three inches under the ground? Okay, now. I blasted you, I let you have it, I told you reality. How upset with me are you? Yeah, not too upset, yeah? First thing you do is you give me a big hug and kiss, run back and dig up the treasure chest. So that's what happens when you show somebody that you know there's a part of you that could be even more perfect. There's a part of you that could be spectacular and it's not there yet. So. That can be very exciting for somebody if they're balanced, if they're emotionally balanced. Tov. So, before you can start to show somebody their flaws, they first have to have some concept of their greatness. Because of Yotze, from all this that comes out, Moscana Lagabi Limud Moser Bidoredo, a conclusion about the way that we learn Moser in this generation. Reishi Starkel Shalalome Moser, the beginning path of somebody who is working on themselves, learning Moser, they're going to make themselves great. The first step is Tsarchliot Limud Romus Adam. You must learn about your greatness. That's got to be the first step. By the way, did Revolba just say that we only learn about our greatness and we never actually get to the buried treasure chest? He said the first step. I mentioned tonight is an introduction. And it's an introduction for a very sophisticated crowd. And you're going to be learning very sophisticated Torah. And we're going to get past the first step in this class. But before it's safe for you to walk around at 27,000 feet without oxygen, you're going to have to get in shape. And therefore, right, tonight we're realizing what has to be in place before the next time that we meet. You've got to have certain ideas, a certain approach to yourself in place, otherwise you won't be able to go the next step and discover what actually could make you really great. Bechelik Arishan Shil, Sefer Ali Shur, in the first section of Revolva's magnum opus, the Ali Shur, Kfar Madnu al Sulamot Aliyanim Saim Bechazal. We already uh, saw the various ladders that people climb within the Torah world in order to great, get to greatness. For Rabbi Seinu, and then they appear in the Torah, and they, 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 they appear in the words of our sages in the, in the Torah in every generation. Vahine, Hasulam Arishon, the very first ladder that we find, Nimsa B'Torah Tzma, we find in the Torah itself. Vahu, what is that ladder? The very first ladder we find is Mimidbar Matana. The Jews traveled from a place called Midbar to a place called Matana. They traveled then from Matana to Nachliel. Then they traveled from Nachliel to Bamos. So our sages say on the spot that th these places weren't really called by these names. And the reason the Torah is calling them by these names is to teach us what stages spiritually the Jews were going through as they traveled. The Jews started off as a midbar, a desert, completely undeveloped. <coughs> they recognized they were undeveloped, they were honest with themselves, and as a result of that, they were given a gift. They were given a certain spiritual awareness, matana. I mean, matana, they traveled to Nachliel. Once they were given that gift, that became an inheritance which they could pass on to their children. Any character traits which you establish within yourself go to your children essentially for free. Umi Nachliel Bamos. But the whole goal is not to stop at Nachliel that you've inherited, that you, you've inherited, that you've, you've achieved and then passed on to your children a great trait. The goal is to get to Bamos. Bamos means the heights. The whole goal is La'anasul Movil, where does the ladder lead to? Bamos, the heights, Romamus. So everything we're going to be doing for the next several months is all going to be aimed at achieving greatness. At the beginning, we're going to learn tonight some techniques 
for you seeing your intrinsic greatness. And then starting in coming weeks, we're going to start looking at some of the things that we can perfect to achieve even more greatness. And you learn to look inside of yourself, see greatness, see flaws, and make repairs. Hamatkil lil mod Musr, someone who starts learning Musr. Tzarech lasok tkufu memushechet, he must start off with an extended period of limud malos, of studying his greatness. Rav Obel told us, he recommends that you, stu- you work on greatness first for about 10 years. <laughs> By the way, he said that like 30 years ago. So today it's probably a little bit more than 10 years. But after 10 years of working on yourself, you'll be a normal, balanced person. Then you're ready to take the next step. I'm assuming you're all there already. Okay. When we learn the famous ladder of Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yair, Shalav Mushtetet Hamisil Shasharim, upon which the, the, the great book, The Path of the Just, is based, Alena Reishis Kol, Lishanein Latzmenu, Shiyeshnan Milo Shil Zahirus, Zrizus, Nikius, Tara. The first thing you do when you open up a book like the Misil Shasharim, which lists off these amazing traits, is don't stop and say, gosh, I don't have the first trait. Well, let me turn to chapter two. No, I don't have the second trait either. Wow, I'm really flawed in the third, the fourth, the sixth, the tenth. For sure I don't have. Don't do that. Rather, what you do is you take the Masilisha Shime, you take the path of just, and you're supposed to use it like a mirror. And you look into the book and you say, wow, you know, I haven't mastered that first trait. But I do remember once, like four months ago, when I did something like that. I do have a little bit of that in me. And, and you know that second trait? Today it happened. It was, there was a moment. It was a moment in my day. But today I saw a little bit. And what you do is you keep finding yourself in the description of those traits. That is, use the book to teach you that such traits exist. Because once you know they exist, then you'll notice them. You'll see them in yourself. You know, the famous metaphor, a, a couple goes to a party. And as they're walking out of the party, the woman says to her husband, oh, the woman is a seamstress. The woman says to her husband, did you see the oyster buttons? And he says, the who? The oyster buttons. How could you have missed the oyster buttons? So why did she notice the oyster buttons? She's a seamstress. Why didn't he notice the oyster buttons? He's a plumber. (laughs) But once you've been trained that there's such a thing in the world, you'll start to see it. Right here, you'll start to see it. So the first thing you do when you open up a Musser book is don't start seeing what you don't have, start seeing what you do have. That's how we're supposed to learn these books, at least for the first 10 years or so. And you gotta learn, these are within our reach, by Sharon Nachli Yehudim, because we're Jews. The kol adam Yisrael yeshlo hachana nafshis lagilem. Every single Jew is pre-programmed. You come with the, 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 the ROM, the chip inside of you, to become like those Musser books describe. My favorite kinds of Musser books are, are, are Musser Sfarim that are biographies that describe a person who starts off ordinary and works and works and works and fails and works and works and works and succeeds a little and then fails more. And then eventually builds him or herself into someone who's spectacular. I love reading those books because that teaches me that every single Jew has that inside of them. And then the only difference between me and them is a lot of hard work. But we can do it. If you wouldn't learn Musser, you wouldn't even know that such spectacular traits exist. Or that human beings, flesh and blood, that we can actually achieve these things in reality. If someone starts to learn the path of the just, and he's doing it for the sake of working on himself, would be very good if in the initial stage, don't stop every chapter and evaluate all the ways in which you're flawed in that midah. Don't do that. Ella, you'll mod at the Mida, learn the trait, Bikol Omka in all of its depth, with all, in tremendous detail, with precision. Vidlamid la harichota, and then teach yourself to value it. Lishto kek aleha, and to yearn for it. 
I'll, I'll, I'll give you a metaphor which none of you may relate to. Probably none of you have ever experienced this sport called window shopping. <laughs> when you go window shopping, you're walking along and you stop and there's this glass window and there's this display. And you look in and you say, I never would have dreamed of such a thing. Look at that. At that moment, even if you can't have it, you're so excited, can't have it right now, you're so excited there is such a thing in the world, you think, okay, maybe someday, maybe someday. A Musser book is meant to be window shopped. That's how you start off. Look at it and say, wow, maybe someday. In this regard, we find something amazing in the writings of the famous Kabbalist, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, 18th century Kabbalist. He wrote what may be the single finest summary of all of Judaism in under 50 pages. It was called the Derech Eitz Chaim. It's printed sometimes in the back of the Mesil Shisharim. Uh, an astounding little work. I don't think it's been translated yet, but it would be a very good thing if it was. And in that book, he writes the following. And here you're starting to hear advice for what you may want to do in the next few days. Why don't you focus your heart, even just for an hour, on this topic? Think for a moment. What are you? Lama Bala Olam. Why were you sent to planet Earth? What does God want of you personally? What's it going to look like at the end? Many people are afraid to contemplate the end because they never got in touch with their greatness, but it doesn't have to look that way. I spent three years as the, the Rav of the hospice at Cedar sinai Hospital. And I, during that time, I helped hundreds of people make a transition. None of, my, none of my patients there survived. And I saw the different experiences that people have when they die. So there is a, a terrifying sort of death. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a time when people think, I'm not ready for it to be over because forget about, I didn't even start to get done what I was supposed to get done. I don't even know what I was supposed to get done. And that can be a very confusing experience for somebody. That can be a very scary experience for somebody. But I, I saw people die another way as well. I saw people who, for decades before they ended up in Cedar sinai Hospital, they had clarity. And they understood what life was about. And they made very serious decisions about how they were going to live their life, and what things they were going to pursue, and what things they were not going to pursue. And they pursued those things with vigor. And at the end of their lives, they were so proud because they had accomplished their mission. Now I admit, it's a very small group of people because most people don't ever take a class like this. Most people don't pause to do this. And there are a few Yechide Segula, there's some very special people out there that on their own stop and say, I'm going to work out the whole thing myself and figure out why I'm here. And if we do that, then contemplating the last moment can be very exciting. The ship came in. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? In, you, you realize, I don't have that many breaths left. It's about to be over. And I pulled it off. And I'm going in front of the Rebbe I'm going to meet God now. I'm going to tell him, you know what? I did it. You sent me to planet Earth, and planet Earth is different. I did it. I did what I was supposed to do. Can you imagine that kind of a feeling? He says, why don't people think about that? We're all going to have that experience. We're all going to have to face that moment. Why don't we think about what do I want it to look like? It doesn't have to be scary. The, the Ramchal never exaggerates. That was one of his traits. There's not an extra letter, right, in the first, what is it, nine chapters of the Mesil Shisham, not an extra letter. He writes here, this is the single most powerful medication you can give against the Yetzirah. 
against the forces of, of, of evil and selfishness and destruction that are inside of each of us. The thing that pulls us all towards self-destruction, you want to neutralize that? The single most powerful medicine, he says, is think about why you were sent here. Think about what it's going to be like. Vihikala, and it's so easy to do. Just daydream. Upulasa gedola, and the fruit that it puts forth is tremendous. Upiria rav, and it's, it's, it's tremendously productive. How do you do it? Shamoda adam bekol yom, lefachot sha. A person should pause every day. He recommended for an hour. I'll recommend for a minute. <laughs> Stop for an hour, he says. Panui mikol shar machshavos. Free your head of everything else. Lachshov rakal inyanazeh. To think just about this. Shamarti, just what I was describing. Vivake shbil vivol. And then he should start to ask in his heart. Masu rishoni, mavus olam. What are the, 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 the first great people to walk planet Earth? Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Sar, Rivka, Rachel, Leah. What did they do? Shekach hashak Hashem behem. That Hashem loved them so much. I remember the first time that I considered this question, I was shocked. Because I always thought that, well, God loved Avram because he was Avraham. But then I realized that Avram wasn't Avraham. Avram was Avram. He was raised in ur uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> he, I shouldn't, Las Vegas actually has a very nice Jewish community, right? right? Not Las Vegas, I don't know, right? right? I don't know, Amman, yeah, okay, right? Mecca. So he was raised in a bad place. He was raised in a bad place. And, and he, 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 he wasn't intrinsically lovable. I should say he was potentially lovable. But he made himself loved by God. What did he do? I remember I thought about it. I thought, what did he do? What did he do? And then I, I, I realized, oh, I know, I know what he did. We had guests over. He poured water for them. Right? He stood over them and he poured water. So that was amazing. That's all you have to do to become great? Now, of course, it's not the pouring of the water. It's that Avraham discovered within himself, I am a Baal Chesed, I'm a person who takes care of others. And he found people out there who needed, needed someone to take them into his tent, and he took them into a tent, and he was himself for them. He was exactly who he is. So he poured water for them. It was a simple, mundane act, which was pouring his personality into reality. And it was, it, it was so beautiful. Hashem said, that's why I sent you. What did he do? He mentioned to people, by the way, you know there's a God? Because that's who he was. So when he acted that way, it was beautiful. It was so simple, so mundane. He just became himself. What did Sarah do? Think about this. What did Rivka do? What did Leah do? What, what was their godless? What, I mean, you know the Midrashim. What did Rachel do? It was so mundane what she did, but it was her. It was so her. And it changed the universe because she came and she was her. Masa Moshe Rabbeinu Olav Shalom. What did Moshe do? I thought about this. What did Moshe do? So again, don't, you can't copy Moshe because you're not Moshe. But what did Moshe do? Moshe was a shepherd. That is, he took care of these sweet little harmless sheep who couldn't defend themselves. And he was out there shepherding, and one of the sheep suddenly bolted from the pack. And the sheep ran away. And as he's running after the sheep, he sees the sheep runs towards water. And the sheep started lapping up the water. It was very, very, very thirsty. So Moshe Rabbeinu thought, he got out of himself. He didn't think about himself. He felt what it was like to be the sheep. If the sheep was that thirsty, and he was walking for so long thirsty, if I was a sheep and I was walking for that long thirsty, I'd be very tired. The sheep must be tired. So he picked the sheep up to carry it back to the flock. That's something would have occurred to most Rabbeinu. He picked the sheep up, and when he turned around, what was there? The burning bush. <laughs> You're Moshe Rabbeinu, let's go. You brought forth your potential. What did he do? He picked up a sheep. <laughs> that was the whole thing, he picked up a sheep. 
But he was pouring himself into the world. That's why it was so great. Meaning you don't have to, you don't have to go out and fight a war unless you're David Melech. But you have to, you, what you have to do is you have to be yourself in mundane situations, doing what you would do and nobody else would do. Right? And that will change the universe. That's why you were sent here. And he says, contemplate that. What did Moshe do? Masa David Mashiach Hashem. What did David Melech do? The Kolagadoli Mashiach Yulafanenu. And all those great, those great people who lived before us. And if you think this way, if you contemplate what others did to become so great, Yale Besichlo, it will occur to you. Ma tov la Adam kol yamei la sot. Exactly what was so great about what these people did, it would be good for me to do. It would be good, not for me to copy them, but it would be good for me to become myself like they become, became themselves. I'll confess something to you. I met the author of this book. I met Revolba. And I was astounded. I was I was bowled over. And I, I remember thinking, I, I don't know if I've ever met a human being this big before. And at the time, I didn't realize that it's not just big, but he had become himself. That was the whole point. But I realized he's big. And I was inspired. I said, you know what? I want to become big, too. So. I followed Revolba around, trying to copy every single thing he did. So I tried to walk like him, and I tried to talk like him. Right? <laughs> One day, I'm speaking to my wife. And, and when my wife is speaking to me, I'm going like this. And she says, why is your hand next to your ear? You're not hard of hearing. <laughs> and I realize Revolba is. He always used to listen like this. At a certain point, Revolba said to me, he said, Labe, I don't understand. Why did God make you? He already had me. <laughs> the goal is not to copy somebody else. That's not the goal. The goal is what we're going to be doing in this class, which is to figure out who are you, and then to become that. And Ramchal concludes, as a suru then your mind should wander to think, be'ez matzav. Who nimsa ovel made? Where are you holding right now? Where are you in the process? Are you indeed perfect? Are you completely flawed? You're somewhere in between? What's perfect? What strengths do you have I can use to help you build up the parts of you that are weak? What parts of you are weak that need to be developed? And if you do this, he says, Adam if someone doesn't think about this, Kashalo. This is a person who never repeats himself. There's no extra letter in, it, in, in, in the first nine chapters of his book. Here he says, if a person doesn't think about greatness, it will be kashelo. If he said kashelo, I would think it's almost impossible. But he said it will be kashelo me'od me'od l'hagiel l'shleimus. To, to achieve perfection will be very, very difficult, which means forget it. If you don't think about greatness and what it looks like and what you could be, but if you do think about this, karov aleha me'od, you are very close to achieving it just by contemplating. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to give you an assignment. And the assignment that I want to give you to start off with is uh, I want you as many times as you can this week to say the following words. If you just flip over the sheet, towards the bottom of the page, Revolba here quotes the Shari Avoda, a book that's attributed to Rabbeinu Yonah, one of our great medieval sages. And this is going to be your assignment. Rabbeinu Yonah says as follows. Hapetach HaRishon Hu, the very first step is, you must know your self-worth. You must recognize your greatness. And the greatness of your forefathers. By the way, every single person sitting in this room is the descendant of very great people because everybody else over the last 2,000 years 
assimilated out of existence. If you're here, it's because there were great heroic individuals who held on by their teeth in order to be here. So think about the greatness of your forefathers, the Gedul Asam, and, and their, 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 their impressiveness, the Chashivu Sam, and their importance, the Chibatim Eitzel Laborius Baruch, and how dear your forefathers were to, to, to God. And then you should struggle constantly to stand in the same level of greatness that your forefathers stood at. And then you must speak to yourself and you must say, and this is going to be your assignment this week. I want you to say several times this week. Adam Gadol V'chashiv Kamoni. A person as great and important as me, Hayom today, Sheishmi Milos Tovos for Ramos Venisaos, I have such spectacular qualities. Shani Ben Gedoli, more than that, I'm the descendant of great people, Ben Malchai Kedem, the, 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 the child of princes from previous generations. Echa Sehara Gedola Azos Vichatasi Lelokim. How could I possibly act inappropriately then, given who I am? and sin against God. Okay. Now, the second half we're going to leave for coming months, sinning against God. But I want you to look in the mirror. I want you to speak to yourself several times this week, and I want you to say the words, Adam Gadol V'chashiv Kamoni. A person as great and as important as me, and try not to laugh when you say it. <laughs> okay, now. Again, I assume we're dealing with a very sophisticated crowd here. I assume most of you had, have done this sort of work before, and therefore this is really just review for you. To the extent that you've done this sort of work, you'll be prepared for what's going to follow in coming weeks. Uh, but just as a review, I'd like everybody this week to practice this exercise. Adam Gadol V'chashiv Kamoni, a person as great and as important as me. Right? If you feel you can't say that, then you didn't get the, you didn't pass the bar for the ratings. This is a PG class, yeah? You have to get over that line. So you, you have to be able to say that before you come back to our next session uh, and, and, and really feel truthfully that you are a, 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 a guttle, a, a person who's great, a person who's very, very important. Okay, I want to stop for a moment, take some questions, if there's questions, and if not, we'll take a break. Yes? What's the line between a person who's great as me and being yourself confident and being that? Excellent. This is a very important question, the obvious and most basic question, question we all would like to know the answer to, which is, where is the thick red line that separates someone who feels that they're great from someone who, who is haughty? Because certainly the Torah is encouraging us to feel great, but the Torah is discouraging us from experiencing haughtiness, Gaiva. So it's a very thick, very recognizable red line. It will not be confusing to anybody. It's very, very simple. If you say, I am the greatest thing since sliced bread, Baruch Hashem, you are called a very humble person. By the way, who is the most humble of all men? Moses. Who wrote that Moses was the most humble of all men? Moses. <laughs> but he wrote, I'm the most humble of all men, Baruch Hashem. He attributed his greatness to God. He recognized reality and attributed his greatness to God. If I would draw a, a, a chart for you, and on one side I would put humility, and then on the other side, I, would, I guess in the middle I would put humility, on one side I will put haughtiness. The haughty person says, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, and I did it all myself. I'm the self-made man. That's heresy. I'm not a self-made man. I'm uh, 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 the handiwork of God. And God gave me all these potentials, and God created all of these situations in life which are going to bring forth those potentials. So I owe it all to Him. But I am pretty great. I am pretty great. By the way, if I say I'm not that great, I'm on the other side of the scale. That's called shiflut. That's low self-esteem. I'm not that great. And the problem with I'm not that great is the exact same problem as saying I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread and I did it all myself. They're both lies. They're both inaccurate. To say I'm not that great, what are you talking about? Who made you? Yeah, I, I want to see, like, the, you know, the next time that you make dinner for your husband, he says, oh, it's not that great. <laughs> right? Who's he insulting? He's insulting the maker. So how can you say about yourself, I'm not that great? You can't say such a thing. You have to say, in potential, I'm spectacular. 
And more than that, Hashem has dropped plenty, God has dropped plenty of opportunities in front of me for developing myself, and many of those I've taken advantage of. I'm a work in progress, but I've achieved a lot, and I've got a lot more potential. That's called humility. That is humility. So the thick red line is, do I attribute it to God or not? If I attribute it to God, then that's called humility. If I attribute it to myself, that's called gaiva, that's haughtiness, and that's, that's evil. Another question, yeah. Um, you gave us an example of a person who's done this work, and at the end of their life, they're like ready to go. Are, after this class, are we going to be able to feel like we actually have good confidence that we know what we're doing? Because we can't really know 100% why Hashem put us here. Excellent. The, th the question is like this. At the end of this class, will you be able to say, oh, now I have complete clarity about exactly why I'm here? Yeah. So the answer is no. And in fact, one of the first things we're going to learn when we meet the next session is that no one could ever teach you what you're here for. What you're going to discover is that it's an ongoing process throughout your life. And there are certain skills that if you possess those skills, you'll hear the messages. You'll understand what, what God is speaking to you and telling you. The point of this class will be to teach you the skills so that on your own, you'll be able to realize what you came to planet Earth for. But it's not that in this class someone could ever teach that to you. No one could ever teach that to you. No one knows. Only you know. And, and you'll discover it using these techniques that we're going to describe in coming months. Um, I, mean, I didn't hear so much about the way just before I asked, but I have a question also then. Um, you know, these people at the end of their life, someone felt like he accomplished his mission and he would say he would be happy. But even if he accomplished his mission, but that's all, you know, like in a big way, you know, like, like we will, you know, do all kinds of things wrong, you know, so won't he be judged for that? Isn't he afraid? How could they not be afraid? You know, I thought everyone's... Afraid of the judgment. Yeah. The question is like this. Uh, we all do things that are wrong. So how could a person ever, at the end of his life, uh, be ready to greet God uh, with pride, knowing that he's made mistakes? So it's a very, very important question. And when I say the answer, it will sound so trite that it may not be comprehensible. So I'll try to explain it a little bit. The answer is that here on planet Earth, throughout your lifetime, there is something called tshuva. Now, the dark side would tell you that you can't ever really do full tshuva. Tshuva gomorrah is impossible. You can't really ever fix up mistakes that you've made. And who actually does real tshuva? No one really does real tshuva. No one's ever fulfilled the Rambam. No one's ever pulled it off. What makes me think that I could ever do it? But Ad Khan Direi Yitzhara, this is all one big seduction by self-destructive forces inside of me. And I have to recognize that the Torah is performable. None of you have a doubt, I hope, as to whether or not you can keep Shabbos. None of you have a doubt as to whether or not you can keep Kashras, right? Everyone here can fill the halacha. And there's a section called Hilchus Tshuva. And if you just follow the simple steps in Hilchus Tshuva, then the mistake is gone, period, gone. So we have those laws, we have Yom Kippurim, we have uh, uh, a, a rich literature that describes exactly how to pull this off, and therefore no one has to show up at the end of their life uh, thinking that they're going to spend eternity in an unpleasant place where it's hot. <laughs> yeah? Right? That's not, no, no one has to get into that situation. Uh, a while back, we did a class, which I think might be worth repeating at some point. It was, um, it, it went on for 51 weeks. The class started the day after Yom Kippur, and it was a class in preparing for Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> and every single week, we did practical uh, preparations so that when Rosh Hashanah arrived, there was no one who was panicked. We were all ready. We knew what we had to do. We had practiced. We had made preparations and were ready to walk into it. So there's no reason that a person can't live their life that way. Uh, and, and so there's no reason that a person has to be panicked at the end. God didn't set it up that way. He didn't set it up to, to, so that your, your whole life would be you know, like a, 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 um, a person floating with, a, you know, with floaties on their arms heading towards Niagara Falls. That's not, that's not the way that it's supposed to feel or look. 
God willing, if we do this properly, it won't look like that. Okay.